My name is Virginia Wright, and I am the Development Director at MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And MAPS and Sophia and Jim Fadiman are hosting this evening tonight. Um, Jim is one of the founders of the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology, which was the original university here. And so he, and he's been working with Rick Doblin, the executive director for MAPS, for many, many years on many different projects. So we continue the work together. It's really fantastic. So I'm going to just give a few words. Then uh, we will have the speakers. Then we will have a short clip uh, from the movie, uh, MDMA the movie. Love me and be made a movie. And then we're going to have a little panel and we'll just sit up here and you can ask us questions. And then we'll have a short break and we will serve you all um, cookies and coffee and wine and have some okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then you can all come back here when you hang out here. We need to be sensitive to the people here. There's the people running the place they like to be gone about 10 o'clock. So we're trying to be done with the talk and the reception and everything by about 10 o'clock. So that's the evening, and um, welcome. And let's start with David Lukoff, who's a professor here at Sophia University. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, how wonderful to see this large crowd gathered here at Sophia to discuss, I think, one of the uh, real renaissance issues in our culture right now. Uh, and with all of the uh, juicy things happening in this field, uh, one might ask, well, why would I pick out a topic like uh, being called to do psychedelic uh, work as a theme? Why not go to the work? Um, well, the choice of this topic emerged out of a conversation that I was having with Jim where I just happened to mention that Marty Seligman uh, asked me to write an article, a chapter, for a book he was editing on calling. And I was going to write about my the psychedelic experience that I had had that called me into my profession as a psychologist focused on spirituality. as been a theme in my work. Um, I don't feel I've been called to work in the area of psychedelics. I look and look through all the articles I've published over the last 35 years. And, Four articles and chapters of mine out of 80 have been focused on psychedelics, and the rest on the integration of spirituality into mental health uh, services. And two of those articles are what I'm going to talk about, uh, focused on my own personal experience of a psychedelic drug triggering a lifelong calling. But it also emerges out of the opportunity I've had to just observe some of the people working in this area. Um, I have known Charlie Grove, one of the pioneering researchers in this area. Many of you know his work using uh, psilocybin with, to deal with existential anxiety at the end of life. And I knew him initially when he was a resident at UC Irvine, and I was a young assistant professor at UCLA, so I'm about seven or eight years older than he was, and he and Gary Bravo who's also authored many books on psychedelics, um, invited me to the UC Irvine uh, seminar that they have for residents. And so I met him there, and we've kept up this relationship that we've had at uh, transpersonal psychology conferences and MAPS conferences and many other venues. And I got to really see what it's like when somebody feels called to a vocation. And I should also mention uh, Rick. I've known Rick for 30 plus years and uh, knew him when he was preaching to the transpersonal choir at, about MDMA at ATP conferences. And then he made that leap into respectability and getting a PhD at Harvard <laughs> and transforming the field. So I see what goes into really feeling like something is a, a, a mission in your life. Um, but I want to go ahead and examine it that theme of calling uh, historically and culturally for a few minutes to then come back to its applicability to the area of psychedelics. So could I go ahead and get the first slide? It's there. And it's up there. Okay. 
God calling. So when I did a search on Google, this is the first image that came up. So we can see a contemporary version of it. But of course, there are many historical versions. Right. Start over. So um, there are many historical versions of this. This is the prophet Nahum, who is one of the uh, lesser prophets in the Hebrew Bible. And his claim to fame was prophesizing the end of the Assyrian Empire before anybody knew what was going to happen. Um, and that's the literal way people saw it as God coming down and whispering into your ear. Oh, thank you. So this is a picture of um, Matthew and the story in the Old Testament is that Matthew was sitting there at the table with his fellow Jewish tax collectors and uh, Jesus came up and he said unto him, follow me. And he, Matthew, arose up and followed him away from his wayward ways of uh, money lending and so on. And this is supposed to be a painting by Caravaggio that I don't think the quality comes through very well. But it's really, and you don't see Jesus, you just see the light that's emanating from Jesus casting uh, uh, onto Matthew's face at the very moment that he realizes that he's being called. The big theme in religious literature there, of course, is the Annunciation. And that's a little above and beyond being called away from the table. Uh, to be informed here by the Archangel Gabriel that uh, she was being impregnated by none other than God himself. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, and by the way, you do this kind of research on the internet, you never know what's going to come up. So one of the things that kept coming up when I was looking for this image were jokes about being Mary being told that she was chosen for an immaculate conception and then complaining, you mean I'm not going to have an orgasm? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Joan of Arc also um, led her, the true uh, group of soldiers against the uh, uh, British who were inhabiting England at the time. And uh, it's still big heroin in that French culture for that reason. Uh, but also, that's an experience not limited to Christianity and uh, the Old Testament, Judaism, but it's Abrahamic in that it also is found in Islam. Uh, al Qaim the Amrila is a prophet uh, that, act, and the name actually translates to the one called by God. And after he had a vision, uh, he led a military movement, uh, like Joan of Arc, that forced the Portuguese out of their uh, uh, coastal positions and their power base in Marrakesh. So this is kind of a stereotypical image that we that, you know, have been brought up with, I think, here in the West Judeo-Christian culture of being called with angels and trumpets and Christ himself coming and saying, follow me. But in my experience, that is not characteristic of other religions. I've done some Buddhist practices and met Buddhist monks, and I've never heard one talk about Buddha coming up to them in a vision and saying, come hither you know, and meditate. Uh, so it's not something that is part of Judeo-Christian, uh, beyond Judeo-Christian religion. Uh, but it certainly does happen outside of Judeo-Christian religion, this in the West. This is a vision of William Blake uh, from his book, The Visions of the Daughters of Albion, which is actually a kind of feminist uh, account of this woman who was unjustly raped and then ostracized by not only people who raped her, but her own family and so on. It's 
story that still happens to this day. Uh, but he was highlighting that dilemma through the mechanism of the vision. Okay. Um, so, enough about all these other people. I want to talk about my calling. <laughs> and um, I, I think the reason that it's I think fitting to share it is it was treated by a psychedelic drug, and I think it has some of these characteristics that I want to share about the power of feeling one is being called to something. Um, okay, so let me just point out that Joseph Campbell lists three stages in the hero's journey, and the first is the call, and that's that experience where you just wander away from whatever it is, or leave, whether, uh, from whatever your life has been about, and go and pursue another path in life. And then the initiation includes all the struggles uh, and the contests and battles that are involved in finding your way on this new path. And then the return stage, which requires that one bring everything one has learned back to the culture uh, and, uh, uh, and share it uh, in a way that benefits all of humankind. So I'm getting a little bit of a buzz. I don't know if it's bothering The anybody. sound system okay. here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the story I want to share was an experience I had when I was 23. And I had been a graduate student at Harvard, got my master's degree in anthropology, and had a very precipitous existential crisis of questioning why was I in graduate school. Both my parents had PhDs, my grandfather had a PhD, and I was really, at that time, questioning whether this was something I had been programmed for, or was this something I really wanted to do in my life. And what I did was, drop out, get rid of everything I own, get rid of it to a backpack, and start hitchhiking around the United States. Basically the opposite of this nice, secure, suburban upbringing that I had been raised with, risking it all, because I basically knew, I knew I needed to do something different. Um, so, finish that by saying, I ended up in San Francisco, 1971, uh, still kind of the 60s in the air, um, such that just walking around Golden Gate Park, somebody offered me a cab of LSD, which I took. In my mind, I was on the road to find out. I'd never done psychedelics before. I was there to try the things in my life that I had been afraid to do and never done. So I waited for the next day, but I did take it. And had a wonderful time in Golden Gate Park, walking around, just seeing the trees breathing, the kinds of experience that I mean, uh, I'm sure many of you could talk about. Going to the ocean and really feeling connected with the waves and the ocean in me and all that kind of good stuff. And went to bed thinking, well, that was really a nice, interesting experience. I might do that again someday. But it didn't feel like it had been life changing. But four days later, I woke up and I was just crashing in an apartment in San Francisco. And walked into the bathroom and just glanced in the mirror. And all of a sudden, I found myself holding my hand in this position, which I would now call a mudra, but you didn't ever hear any of those kinds of terms then, I should mention. I had been raised in a very secular Jewish household with, uh, we were never members of the temple. I didn't learn Jewish prayers, language, rituals, or any of that. I would have no trouble having describe myself as an atheist. Um, and not very interested in that whole area. So as soon as I saw my head's hand in this position, it started to give off a white light. And I knew immediately what that meant. It meant that I was a reincarnation of Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and then, in another flash, I had another delusional insight, as it's called, in the world of psychopathology. That I was a reincarnation of Christ. <laughs> and that I had a new mission, which was to write a holy book that would, for the first time, unite all the peoples of the world. And Christ had just worked with people from 
the West and Buddha for the East. And my mission is to write a book that would unite all people. And I immediately put out a journal I was keeping and started to write down my new holy book. And I knew I needed to get some advice and consultation on this. And I was able, for the next five days, hardly sleeping, hardly eating, uh, to have conversations with all kinds of people like uh, Bob Dylan and Cat Stevens, because I knew that in the 20th century, uh, we needed to get things out in a different way than uh, ancient holy books. So I wanted to talk with them about how to get things out into the public. I talked with Locke and Rousseau about the nature of the social contract, and, who, and Freud and Jung about psychological dimensions of change, R.D. Lang, politics and experience. Many of my students now never even heard of him, but it was one of the most powerful life-changing books in the sources. Uh, and that's Margaret Mead there, consulted with her a bit. And then I took my holy book, made 40 copies of it after five days, and started to distribute it in what I took to be the new Jerusalem. That's a picture of the bottom of Jerusalem and then a kind of new age rendering of Jerusalem. And I went to, of all things, Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, <laughs> at the New Jerusalem, and felt if I started to hand out copies of my book there, they would travel all around the world, and soon I would be recognized as the prophet of this new religion. And so I did that. I started to hand people copies of my book as I was walking around. Um, and yeah, my assumption was they would give them to friends there, and they would give them to other friends. <laughs> it wouldn't be long before these books would be around the world. So I just needed to now hang out for a couple of months and wait for this process to unfold. And I didn't need to tell anybody that I was a messiah or anything. That was all in the book. So I didn't in any way, I think, look or sound psychotic to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> But I was very lucky because I did have friends. I hitchhiked back to Chicago and to Boston and friends there who really put me up. I had no money. They were sleep in their living rooms, fed me. And while well, I was just trying to do this entire way, waiting for all these things to transpire. But after about two months, I realized, hmm, nobody's ringing my phone. Nobody's <laughs> rushing around trying to call me. I'm not finding any the newspapers about this thing. So maybe I needed to do some old work on it. So I got permission from my parents to go to a summer cottage they had in Cape Cod. And had no insulation or any of that. It was March. But I wanted to kind of start to do more work on this book. I felt like maybe if I rewrote it, it would it, blah, blah, blah. So I went to Cape Cod. And I did start to do some reading that was transformative. Read Joseph Campbell for the first time. Read Joe for the first time, and on one hand, it was very validating to see other people concerned with some of these same issues, and it was also deflating, because I realized that, hmm, some of the stuff wasn't as unique as I had thought it was. <laughs> and I also started to have a lot of insomnia, trouble sleeping, and at night, to have these kind of horrific images appearing above me while I was sleeping, or trying to sleep. And I even saw an image of a skeleton kind of hovering above me, which I took to be my own skeleton. And I took, I had a recurrence of an illness I had had as a, a teenager called Crohn's disease, which involves internal cramping and bleeding. It's pretty painful. And I went to a free healthcare clinic and they gave me a bunch of pain medication. And I spent uh, some of those nights sitting there contemplating taking all those meds, thinking that that would be a way to arrived at the state of peace and tranquility that I was lacking at that time. In fact, my life was full of just self-doubt, recriminations, and feeling foolish for having written this book, and then given it away to people, including people like my parents and friends, um, and you know, they dropped me out of Harvard. Is that a stupid note? So this is my depressogenic uh, cognitive world at that point. Uh, but one of the uh, wellness habits that I had was engaging in during that time was taking walks. And I would go somewhere in the early afternoon to the beach and just go 
along the beach. And on one of these, all of a sudden, I heard a voice. And I turned around, thinking somebody had just said something to me, and there was nobody there. And a picture of Joan of Arc with her, I think it Gabriel talking to her, or Michael, giving with her voice experience. But as I say, there was nothing in that to me. But what I heard was, become a healer. So that was kind of, I now recall, my falling. And it took many years for me to kind of unravel that. I first wondered, as an anthropologist, you know, what be a healer mean? Like that guy on the left, the traditional shaman. There are jobs for traditional shamans like that in the 20th century in the country I was living in. But maybe that meant, I thought, you know, I should become a doctor. And are these programs where you can go and spend a year taking biochemistry and organic chemistry and then go to medical school? I thought, maybe, does that what it mean? Then I started to think about things like herbs and things like yoga. And I started to think, well, I should actually go and start to explore these things. Become a healer became my mantra. It displaced all this depressogenic thoughts. Um, my parents agreed to let me to come live at home. And um, um, I was able to start on a path of checking out these things. The, one of the groups I participated in was one of these touchy-feely kind of encounter groups. And that's what kind of grabbed me. And I started to take more group groups, encounter groups, gestalt, and psychodrama, and ultimately worked in that field for a few years as a paraprofessional before embarking on uh, becoming a psychologist, taking the books, and then as part of my integrating this thought in the dealer, I think work with people like uh, Wallace Black Elk, who's in the just saw it. So I think I'll leave it there and leave that as an illustration of a poem and see if we can get Rick from Virginia and Jim to just chime in for uh, a couple minutes, maybe sharing something that served as a kind of poem for them into this domain. Well, my calling uh, didn't come from, it came from the absence of a calling, in a way. I kept taking LSD and I kept thinking that uh, God should come and talk to me and then I would have my calling and I would know what to do and I kept never finding God. There was no personification and finally I felt like that was a blessing in itself. That there was no um, concrete that I had figured out myself. And at age 18, thinking of myself as a countercultural drug using criminal <laughs> from being a draft resistor and an LSD user and all, and then I thought uh, what I really wanted to do was to try to um, get my own psychedelic therapy, become a psychedelic therapist, and bring psychedelic therapy back. And basically, I just um, have been doing that ever since. And some people say, you know, how come you've been doing it for so long? And I was like, well, I've never had a better idea. <laughs> and I, I did have it confirmed for me in a dream. This was um, maybe, uh, I'd say about uh, eight years or so after I had decided to become a psychedelic therapist and dropped out of college and was trying to um, solidify myself a little bit before I went back to school. And the dream was uh, like in 2001 Space Odyssey, where at the very end there's a man in a um, sort of a white room, he's, he's on his deathbed. And so this was, uh, I was there, there was a man on his deathbed, and he said that when he was younger, uh, that he had been miraculously saved from almost being killed, and that he never knew why, but he always felt that he had a mission. And he was telling me now that he realized what his mission finally was, and it was to tell me to be a psychedelic therapist. <laughs> and then he said, I want to show you why, you know, what happened to me that made me think I was saved. And it turned out he was um, a Jewish person in the Holocaust, and he had been taken out to the edge of town with thousands of other people with an open grave, and then a bunch of people had been, they'd all been shot, and he fell into this open grave, but he wasn't killed. And he was buried with all these other bodies. And it was kind of like the Jesus story. So I was seeing this with him. And he took him several days before he kind of came to and crawled up through all these bodies. 
And then um, nobody was there. And he ran off into the woods and became a partisan for the rest of the war. And so I felt like um, this resonated with me because I was very much motivated by the Holocaust to study psychedelics, to think about how could people do that, how could we heal that kind of thinking. And so I, I said to him, yes, I, I will accept this because I had already decided on my own. I felt I could. And so then he died. And then I walked out of this room and it was um, kind of like a stream. I ended up in the stream and there was this young boy that was there and I sat down beside him and we were watching the river, sort of like Siddhartha or so. And then I recognized that this young boy, I knew him, and his father was a friend of mine. And at this time I was particularly worried about being busted. And so I had stored my LSD stash at uh, his father's house. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was sort of all wrapped up together and we just watched the river flow and, and then I woke up. And that, I felt, has been the real confirmation for me of that calling. That's why I do what I do. I don't think I'm particularly called to psychedelics. What I'm really called to is to spend my life work on things that will change the world and make it a better place. And I feel like I've done that three times. Uh, the first time I worked early on with Esalen Soviet American Exchange Program, and we were very involved in bringing Soviets at the time, Soviets to the United States and bringing, putting in a hot tub in Esalen. <laughs> <laughs> I was an intern, and you know, this was my first kind of work like that. Um, and I saw that relationship transform the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. And later on, I worked in women's development, so I worked with, um, right here at Global Fund for Women, I worked with them in the early days where it was noticed that development, changing the world, you know, really improving conditions in places that were poor, needed women at the center of that because the women are the people that, in many places, that you know, raise food and feed people and have clean water and things. And so it really changed the way that international development uh, worked involving women, and that was an amazing uh, experience. And then I met Rick Doblin. <laughs> Not directly, I, I spent a lot of time in the arts because I also feel the arts are an incredible way to change the world. But um, I had an interview with Rick and he said, well, what were your psychedelic experiences? And I got to share that with him. But most of all, I looked at the website and I looked at the research and I looked at what Mass was doing and I was blown away. I thought, my God, this is another one of those moments in time when the world is changing and something really good is going to happen, and I want to see if I can help that happen. So that's how I got involved. Since I'm, since I'm next on the program, I'll do it from here. And after listening to all those people, I, I feel so uncool. <laughs> I had the faintest interest in psychedelics, no visions, no dreams. Um, I'm living in Paris just as long as possible, as cheaply as possible, as self-aggrandizing as possible, as trivial as possible. And um, uh, a professor of mine from Harvard who was still named Richard Alpert was coming through on his way to Copenhagen where he and Tim and Aldous Huxley were going to present about psychedelics. And that's nice, whatever that was. Um, and, but, but Dick showed up as I was, you know, close as, as a student and a professor, and he said the greatest thing in the world has happened to me. I thought, well, that's nice. And I thought, you actually seem a lot less weird and neurotic than I thought you <laughs> And he said, I want to share it with you. I thought, well, how bad could it be? And then he reached in his uh, coat and he took out his little bottle of pills and I thought, what the? <laughs> <laughs> I probably said something like that. And, and so uh, about 45 minutes later, we're sitting at the cafe on the uh, Champs-Élysées, and uh, I am feeling that things are getting very bright, very colorful, and 
I have no idea why. And, and also, I'm noticing the people in back of me who are speaking. You know, I can really hear what they're saying much more clearly than ever, but I also know what they're saying, and I thought, my French isn't that good. <laughs> I've never had that experience. And I said, this is too much for me. He said, Dick said, it's really too much for me, too, and, because I've just never been in Paris. <laughs> so we retreated to my fifth floor walk-up, and I learned that um, my life was not quite as interesting as I thought. <laughs> and a week later, I followed Dick and Tim and, and Aldous to Copenhagen and, and said I'd like more of whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that level, this was kind of what I would now call a fairly low dose of psilocybin. And uh, had a lot of human closeness, and I was not close to too many humans, so this was good. And then, then uh, I don't know if, if this was God intervening, but it sure looked like my draft board. And they basically said, we have two opportunities for you. One is you can crawl on your hands and knees carrying an AK-41 in your, you know, on your elbows and kill people. Or you can go graduate school. <laughs> it was not that easy a choice. <laughs> Uh, but I ended up at Stanford, and Stanford, unknowns to Stanford, had some psychedelic research off campus, and I joined them. <laughs> Actually, that's been true of Stanford ever since. <laughs> and uh, with that group, uh, I took LSD and found out that there was more than human closeness. There was things that many of you know about that, uh, that made some of us into profits and some of us into... Uh, running corporations. <laughs> um, and I thought this was obviously more and better and more exciting than anything else I'd ever dealt with, so I kept doing it. <laughs> and when the government said, you shouldn't do that, I said, well, how about if I do everything but that? And they said, we don't care. So I had a couple of careers, including starting a graduate school with Bob Frazier. <laughs> That was not based on psychedelics. Uh, my part of it was based on psychedelics. His part was based on other spiritual traditions. And uh, here you are. <laughs> so, having, and I'm still doing it, and the government has not yet stopped me. And in fact, the government is, I don't think really cares much what I do, which is just wonderful. <laughs> because as you may find out soon, my interest is uh, well beyond what the government is allowing because since psychedelics were illegal, 26 million Americans, just Americans, have taken LSD, just LSD. So there's a lot of people who share my interests, who are quiet about it. And, and let me just show you what I mean. How many of you have not used a psychedelic? <laughs> somebody bring a new girlfriend or something? <laughs> well, that's what I mean. And how many of you are going to be in a uh, United States approved, FDA approved, 14 other organization approved study next year using a psychedelic? How many of you will be a, a, a member of that study? Okay, one. That's great. How many of you may have a psychedelic in the next year? <laughs> so that's what interests me. And um, I put together um, four one-hour presentations, which I'll do in five minutes each. <laughs> um, probably the most fun I get these days is what is called my working with microdoses. Uh, since I'm dealing with people that know what I'm talking about, microdose is a sub-perceptual dose. It's low enough so the rocks do not glitter, the flowers do not say amen. <laughs> And the walls, they don't even pant, let alone for <laughs> But that's about 10 micrograms and an equivalent in psilocybin and so forth. But what that suggests is there's something in that very low range. And Albert Hoffman said this is the under researched area. And microdosed himself, at least for the last 20 years of his life. And I love it as a role model, where at age 100 he's giving two-hour lectures. Maybe there's something in this. <laughs> so, um, 
me just give you some comments about microdosing. And this is actually um, Albert himself. Um, at low doses, Hoffman noted, is about spiders. The webs were even better proportioned and more exactly built than normally. However, with higher doses, the webs were badly and rudimentarily made. So if you're a spider, microdose. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, tech worker. I microdose ayahuasca for antidepressant purposes. Usually about two grams of cappy in a tea with a small splash from a chacuna tea, but sometimes only the cappy. My first is upon awakening around six, and usually another in the afternoon. I find it if I feel it necessary for mood elevation. Now, he obviously is going to work and leading his life. Um, I, you know, people write me about their microdosing in a particular way, a pro protocol that I actually send them, which says take it no more than every fourth day. Uh, because one of the curious things about it, and, and you all know that LSD at last 8 to 12 hours, psilocybin 5 to 8, DMT, and so forth. <laughs> Microdoses tend to be two days. We don't know why, because of course we can't do any research. Microdosing has allowed me to unlock my potential and to live fuller, to be engaged in an individual moment, which allowed me in turn to be more focused and happier. I'm much more empathic and willing to give people the benefit of the doubt. I feel lighter all the time, even on day three of the routine, meaning having not taken it for two days. I rarely get angry and stressed anymore. Since I've started microdosing, I've been eating much healthier and exercising more and it hasn't been forced. I started doing yoga and meditating daily, rather organically. It all just happened. Now, one of the things, as you know, is there's one thing to say, well, I've taken psychedelics and I've seen God and I'm a new person. The other is, does anyone who lives with you notice any improvement? <laughs> In this case, this is from his girlfriend. I've noticed huge changes in his ability to be okay with emotional discomfort, both in himself and with his kids, gradually over the past few months, parentheses, right, like a lifetime worth of changes made over a few months could be called gradual. And she goes on to talk about individual moments and then concludes by saying, here are a couple of examples of the changes I see in many areas that revolve around his willingness to accept discomfort as an important part of life, an important part of being, instead of something to be avoided or minimized at all costs. And this suggests some, obviously, psychotherapeutic possibilities. That's one of the areas. This is from someone who has a very interesting job, kids, parents, you know, full life, and have been Basically, what he said is, I'm coming off it. It's, it's extended range, and if you've ever opened an extended range pills, there's a couple hundred little micro dots in there. And she was taking one less dot a week and still having effects, kind of side effects of coming off it. And at some point, um, this is just fascinating to me. Um, in the initial days when I stopped it completely, I found it useful to take a microdose every day. I tried to stick to the protocol three days, but symptoms were just so bad I couldn't go without. The one drop made a world of difference for my pain and other symptoms. My body was so sensitive I was afraid of taking anything. I felt disassociated from my body, like my mind and limbs were two separate entities. The waves of fibromyalgia and itchiness were overwhelming and the headaches were crushing. The drops gave me distance. Nothing I was taking was dulling the pain. But with the drops, I felt the pain separately from me. So it wasn't so intense. And she goes on in some detail to discuss this disassociation as what happened for her. Now, so far, N of 1. However, in many other sciences, an N of 1 says there's something there. Um, she goes on and basically says, I didn't identify. She also then had waves of sorrow or waves of mania, which she also disassociated and watched because she understood 
That was her brain resetting itself, and the emotions were not about anything in her life. Big revelation, and she kept her distance. And she ended up being very creative, which, since she was an artist, was wonderful. She said she did her, some of her most interesting work during this period of tapering. So that's an interesting area. Um, let's take a different drug, one that some of you may know about. It's called Adderall. If you don't know it, it's called speed. <laughs> the two are identical. Except one you can buy with your children. <laughs> right, this is someone who um, is, a, uh, is a chef and, and quite different from the other people. I rarely take Adderall anymore. This is someone who now microdoses once or twice a week. I rarely take Adderall anymore. He was taking a huge amount. And when I do, I'm struck by what a high price I pay for four to six hours of quick and easy dopamine rush. The countdown can be horrendous. And I'm also, curiously, I'm also, like the other person, I'm steadily increasing my yoga regime and becoming more mindful of the need to develop mindfulness practice. I've started practicing some African drum rhythms on the drum I've owned for years, but only so far it served as a nice piece of home decoration. So that's microdosing, just a sampler of what's going on. And people write me and say, I would like to microdose. Have you any suggestions? I send them a protocol and say, keep records. We are exploring this very unknown area and unpublished. Now, the only thing that is published is a chapter in my book um, where, which are a couple of case studies in some, in some length. So that's microdosing. Um, just a, a kind of little commercial for are psychedelics part of other religious traditions? And the answer is, whenever we track it down, it is. That's Buddhism, that's Sufism, and just a little note from Patanjali, Yoga Sutras. The subtler attainments come with birth or are attained through herbs, mantra, austerities, or concentration. For those of us who are not good at mantra, <coughs> austerities, or concentration, it's nice to know that we're from an old tradition. Another area, cluster headaches. Cluster headaches. How many of you have ever had a migraine? Okay. Imagine on a scale of 1 to 10, migraines of 2. Clusters are almost all 9 and 10. They are more painful than the most painful childbirth. They're more painful than a kidney stone. That's about the highest pain that men get women do childbirth. Um, they are compared to be more painful than having a limb amputated. They're bad. And there turns out to be something that can help. And um, I've been, uh, I went to a, a conference and asked people would they fill in a form about their own experience using psychedelics. My sample at the moment is small. It's about half men, half women, about 25 people. One of the questions I asked was, how many medications have you had prior to discovering psychedelics? These are all medications prescribed. This is not street stuff. Of my sample, seven of them have had more than 70 medications. And some operations, there are brain operations that don't work. There's an enormous span of medications that don't work. A uh, number of them had, lots of them had at least 20 medications. Um, it's basically has no, nothing really helps very much. A couple of medications dampen the headaches. That's about as good as you can get. But if people take psychedelics, not only when they have a headache, they can bring it down. They can turn it off. And clusters come in two forms. One is called episodic, which means you can, you can literally put on your calendar when the next time you're going to have a series of these headaches. They're also called suicide headaches, because people will kill themselves rather than do it again. And there's called chronic, which is even worse. So I ask people, if you're using psychedelics, what are you doing? Because there will be a study probably in a year or so at Yale um, 
putting this into some scientific framework. It's about 300,000 people in the United States with this condition. It is the most debilitating condition you can imagine. They're also called ice pick headaches because the sensation is having an ice pick plunge through your body. That's generally kind of where you get them. And they last for 20 to 40 minutes. And they're called clusters because if you have one, you'll have five. Okay. What are some people doing? Two grams of psilocybin mushrooms dried every week to break the cycle, prevent them. Lower doses every other month to keep cycles from starting. So this is someone who breaks a cycle in when he's in it, he or she, and has a way of preventing them from happening. This is unbelievable given the 70 meds that didn't work. One to two grams at first dose. One week later, I do another gram, and my clusters go away. A letter from someone I met at the conference who said, I'm using psilocybin mushrooms. If I'm unable to get them, I will kill myself, because I now know what it is like to be pain-free, and I cannot go back to the way I was. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you just a little more complicated, because people take this obviously very seriously. While in cycle, 1 to 3.5 grams of psilocybin, or 1 to 3 hits of LSD, or 75 rigocorombosa uh, seeds in water every five days. The seeds work for two years, but no lost effectiveness. I have to use psilocybin or LSD now. When a cycle starts, it can take 15 to 45 days, and of then stopping it every five days to completely wipe it out. But frequency and intensity of the headaches are greatly reduced during this time. As you know, most of you know something about the, the post-traumatic stress work that MAPS is so involved in. This is a condition which we can prevent occurring periodically. Um, it would be nice if the federal government would allow these people to do this. Uh, it's only very important. A number of psychedelics work. Psilocybin works, LSD works, mushrooms work, and of course people are now in this in this uh, group of cluster sufferers. There's a there's a group go online look it up called Cluster Busters, <laughs> and it's basically people helping each other, including best ways to grow mushrooms, best ways to take the seeds which have LSA, lysergic acid, amide, in them without without the feeling that you just eat a whole bunch of wood and you're really sick. <laughs> things like that. Just very practical things. And they're, they're just amazingly brave and wonderful people. One of the questions I asked some years ago, when I was coming down on the government for not making my career wonderful, <laughs> is, yeah, you made it illegal, but since 25 million people have taken it, have you asked them anything? And then I thought, I could ask. So I asked. And actually, you're just lucky I didn't bring my forms. <laughs> because I've been asking groups when I talk to them to just fill in when I have a whole evening, fill in just basic what have you taken, uh, what worst trip, best trip, any particular breakthroughs, any physical changes, because I kind of now know what happens. And it turns out that um, there are differences in psychedelic use control your excitement, between Yale and UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> People at UC Santa Cruz take anything. <laughs> Carefully, and with enormous sophistication. People at Yale take very little, but it matters more to them. And a rather high percentage of the people that filled in my little form had changed their major. You know, like from banking to botany. <laughs> <laughs> and people in botany had changed to psychology. <laughs> and my favorite of the, of the Yale group, there was uh, two people. One said, it totally deepened my connection with my religious tradition. The other said, my religious tradition turned out to be hogwash, <laughs> and I totally dropped it. <laughs> Same tradition. <laughs> 
So one of the, the groups I asked outside of college was a group in England at some place called the October Gallery and uh, basically said, what have you been taking? The youngest, this was a nice mixed group, age 22 to 71, average five and a quarter different substances with at least nine out of the 40 having tried more than nine. And the most common is the kind of research that, as I say, it's not hard to do. Uh, most common was, and this is, I would have had a PowerPoint, but if I can't read at the bottom, you couldn't either. Um, psilocybin was most, by most people. Now, England has something called mushrooms that are called fairy caps. And they grow everywhere. Now, why they weren't using them for the last 500 years, I do not know, but they are using them now. <laughs> LSD was second, MDMA third, and then a term that, that I hope is becoming current, which we call the alphabetamines. That's all the things that are only known by letters and that nobody has ever been able to do any legal research with, which you can buy fairly easily. Most of those in England were 2CB. Ayahuasca, then DMT, ketamine, mescaline, peyote, salvia. Salvia is way down there, just five out of the 40. And then I had an opportunity, because I, I love to play science. I don't believe much in it, but I like to play. And I was, I looked, one of the things that's hard to find is a, what, the, you know, what everyone calls is a control group. And I thought, I could ask people who aren't coming to a meeting like this, what they've done. And I was given the opportunity with a, an ITP graduate who was teaching at Foothill, just a psychology course. And I said, can I ask your students? And she said, yeah, sure. Just make sure that you know they, get, they benefit from it, they teach themselves and so forth. So I got my little form out. And I went to the Foothill class. And um, about 28, 30 students. And I explained what we we're doing and that they, and, and I said, you know, for using psychedelics, what's a psychedelic? And I said, if some of you never taken any of the da 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 da, and a lot of the other up. I said, well, you, you, you fill it out for alcohol. A lot of them said, I haven't had alcohol either. I said, coffee? <laughs> You're supposed to give students something to do about consciousness changing. So I have data on coffee, alcohol, and psychedelics. Now, my control group was, I would say, interesting in its own right. Of the 30 or so students, 11 had taken MDMA, and 8 had taken salvia, 7 LSD, 7 psilocybin, and one person had taken DMT. That's the control group. That's the undifferentiated sample. Now, you might say, well, psychology, people are interested at least in consciousness, and, and they were. But it looks like the culture is far more um, filled with psychedelic interests and experiences than even those of us who eat, breathe, and talk about it all the time. Uh, no. So my, my presentation included the word more. And the question that really was asked about calling is, what are we doing this for? Well, we all have our reasons and we all think we're doing good. And so do the, so the people who we're most against, by the way, often think they're doing good. And sometimes they even are. But I just came across something. This is just a comment from someone, a student somewhere about their own psychedelic experience, unknown, undifferentiated, et cetera. I'm a much, and this is actually, I found this to be similar to the Santa Cruz students. That they weren't taking psychedelics for any of the, the highfalutin, spiritual, and scientific, and psychotherapeutic reasons I think are totally necessary. They're just tripping. <laughs> but, this is now just someone talking who's just tripped. I'm a much more loving, understanding, open-minded, and creative individual than I would be without the psychedelic experiences of my early 20s. I'm 27 now. I'm much more accepting of myself, including both my strengths and my weaknesses. I've been far more receptive to healthy living. 
including avoiding processed, non-nutritious foods and utilizing exercises and mindfulness meditation as a direct result of my experience. Now, have you guys talked to Whole Foods? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're benefiting from our work. <laughs> Now, the other thing is, and we talked about initial experiences, of which, and, you know, it's really actually a pretty good book. <laughs> and I had to kind of squeeze it out of it, but it was really kind of a nice book. This is someone who comes from a family that's quite awful, and that his parents were quite awful, and that he was uh, addicted to three or four different substances, in and out of therapy, 25 years of medication. He took LSD with a guy somewhere. I have hated and blamed my mother and father and hated and blamed myself for hating and blaming my mother and father. <laughs> I hated them for hurting me and I hated me for hurting them. When I was sitting on the grass, I realized something. Nobody got hurt. Nobody. Does that make any sense? Then he ends something that says, I've always loved my mother. I've always loved my father. I've always loved my brother. Because I've always loved me. That seems to me something that feels like a good thing that all of us are interested in and helping each other with. Now, one of the questions that I see when people, uh, as I go online and read, a lot of people just talking about infinite ways to get high, I have some concern. And uh, I was talking with Rick Strassman, whose wonderful book on DMT you know, and whose remarkable book on uh, that Jewish prophecy comes probably out of a DMT state, you don't know yet. It's, it's kind of wild. And what, what Rick says, in other words, if we cannot articulate, apply, and integrate, and share the psychedelic spiritual information these states convey, I'm afraid they will gather dust. And so as an individual, the question is, you know, we kind of get the chance to do that, to articulate, apply, and integrate. But all of us can. And the other, the other piece that I'd like to give you on more, because this is really very new, um, one of ITP's most interesting graduates, Alicia Danforth, is now working with Charlie Grove on a study of using MDMA to give people who are high on the autism scale, called Asperger's, except we took their name away, to allow them to get the information that they often lack, which is about social interaction. I'm in correspondence with one of these people who just wrote me and said, are you interested in what I'm thinking about? And he is experimenting with a huge number of substances, psychedelics included, uh, teas and herbs, and, and he keeps meticulous notes. He's got, as he said, out of all the defects of autism in terms of personal life, but when I get focused, you know, I'm terrific, and he is. And so I'm learning from him a huge amount of what substances affect people in what ways and how to use them for, as he says, I have different drugs for social events, for class, for speaking up in class, which I would never do. Um, he recently discovered, as he said, cactus. <laughs> he said, it's amazing how cactus has worked so hard hard to get the mess one out of it. <laughs> but also, he's got several theories about autism, and including uh, why, for instance, people in the high end of the autism scale have lower glucose levels in their brain. And he says, because we're working hard than you all are, because we're, we are very good locally and not good in, in larger ways. Anyway, he's just someone I'm enormously fond of. And he writes me these wonderful descriptions of the experiments he's running. And very recently, um, he's starting to guide people. And he's saying that how that feels like a life calling that might be of interest to him. And so that's some of what I'm doing. And we haven't talked about using psychedelics for creativity, um, but you are in Silicon Valley, and whether you know it or not. 
And um, those of you who've been to Burning Man, um, you've seen what psychedelic creativity is, can be. And those of you who've not been to Burning Man, wish you'd been to Burning Man. <laughs> and I must say, when we started this evening, and they said, well, it's going to be really warm in here, and I go, I know what people would do at Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say anything because I wasn't running the mic. <laughs> so, that's a little bit of the kinds of things that are happening outside of the formal research area. And there are, there are terms that I use if I'm forced to, because um, I have a, a vocabulary. When you write a dissertation, you have to learn to write terribly poorly of a particular form. <laughs> but you end up with a lot of words that are useless in any other situation. So I can use those words. But basically, um, I let people tell me their stories. And I sometimes suggest ways that their stories could be improved. And that seems to be useful. And the, the culture is way ahead of the science. And the science is way ahead of the regulations. And the regulations are way ahead of the legislation. So I guess it would be a pun if I said this is a grassroots movement. <laughs> but as you notice, the grass people are doing very well. <laughs> and when, when we've been to the national drug forums, Basically, we get together and we say, guess who's next? If you're going to be changing the laws so that people do not suffer, live in pain, live in psychological distress, post-traumatic stress disorder, being anxious about dying. It's one of the curious things about people with psychedelic experience. They, they're not any fonder of suffering than anyone else. But they're not as worried about dying. That's important. And that's something that you all represent. So we all have work to do. Um, let me know if I can help you with yours. non-psychedelic version of LSD actually turned out to work even better than LSD. And so now it's in developed. Part of the reason is because you can take it in milligrams, whereas the LSD or the, uh, you take it micrograms, and even the psilocybin you take in relatively small numbers of milligrams. But bromo LSD you can take large amounts, you're not going to get high. And so there is a pharmaceutical company in the Bay Area for profit now that's trying to develop uh, bromo LSD for cluster headaches. So 
the message isn't necessarily that psychedelics are the best for everything, but this whole discovery would never have happened without psychedelics. Um, and then just in terms of the uh, quotes that you gave, which I thought were really good, um, I actually had a chance to get in touch with Kerry Mullis, who was the one that uh, won the Nobel Prize for chemistry for uh, polymerase chain reactions, which is what is used now in uh, replication of DNA. And he attributed a lot of his creativity to LSD and marijuana. And he wrote me this statement that was just fantastic. And he said I could quote from, he said, I would have been stupid in some respects if it weren't for my psychedelic experiences. This is a Nobel Prize winner. I would have been stupid in some respects if it weren't for my psychedelic experiences. Um, so I, I actually grew up a very conventional, straight guy. My parents uh, never met a law that they wanted to break. <laughs> Only recently is my 86-year-old mother breaking the law uh, because she's having some uh, memory problems and they're wanting to take away her driver's license and she's like, I'm still going to drive. <laughs> so she's driving illegally right now. I love her neighborhood with my 90-year-old father guiding her where to remember to turn and stuff. So that's the first time in the history of her entire life she's ever broken the law. Um, and I, became, I evolved out of that, um, not out of any intention to become a counterculture or drug-using criminal, but merely because the world sort of presented me with a bunch of options that I didn't find particularly uh, acceptable. And so really what I want to do is become a normal, traditional, law-abiding person who just happens to love psychedelics and marijuana and have found a way to integrate them into my life. So what I'm going to talk to you about in a brief way and what we'll talk about more in the questions and answers is how are we doing to try to normalize and mainstream psychedelics? What is the process that we're going through? How do we achieve that? I think you could say from your experience possibly with Tim, that there, there are certain people, there's a romance to being a rebel. And there's something really nice about saying, I've got the truth and you're never going to let me show it, you guys are always going to be against me, and then you're never really called to integrate and to make it, make it happen, but you can still be in your mind uh, you know, the possessor of the, the way. But I, I would also like to say a tremendous respect for Tim and the way in which he was championing the, the role of the individual against the state. And I think now with what we've learned about Edward Snowden's revelations and others, we really need to have a lot more emphasis on the protection of individuals and the protection of individual freedom, individual religious freedom, individual cognitive liberty against the potential oppression of the state. So I think Tim was fantastic in that. that there was one time at a MAPS conference in 1990 uh, where Daniel Ellsberg was there and a bunch of people were there and I asked him, uh, you know, could you give me some advice on how to work with the government? We had so much time you know, interacting with the government, doing research, can you give me some advice on how to work with the government? And he's like, fuck the government. <laughs> I'm so far beyond with getting government permission. Um, but I said, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. But not for me. So I think the way that uh, you know we saw by the raising of hands, how many of us are not particularly constrained by uh, the rules that come down, um, because I think they are so misguided. But but I really want to change the rules, and I want to try to work in a federal level, international level, and legitimize this area because I think there are a lot of people like my parents who really don't want to break the law, who could benefit incredibly, and so I think there and there's a lot of added paranoia, added stress, um, all different ways that, that the fact that these drugs are criminalized is, is really more of a problem. So I think this overall effort is really uh, necessary and also the federal government ch tends to uh, change the last. I mean we see this with medical marijuana and marijuana legalization. Change happens in the states, it bubbles up and the, the feds are going to be the last to change. But I've taken on the idea of trying to work through the federal system, through the FDA, and we're making an enormous amount of progress. And it really looks pretty good over the next uh, five to 10 years. And so what I talk about is new therapies and also kind of new business models. And when I was preparing for this talk earlier today, something pretty uh, convenient happened. Uh, 
it turned out that um, uh, CBS News has this feature. Um, they call it the way it was. And you know, every day or something, or they, they sort of tell you what was happening in the past on this particular day. So today, 30 years ago, what CBS is wanting to feature was Dan Rather talking about MDMA. <laughs> and so we have that clip to show you from three years ago, but we have this one uh, statement was great. Chemists, this is how it started, right? Chemists call it MDMA for short. Users have another word for it, ecstasy. Federal officials call it an underground drug that's going nationwide. Soon they hope to call it illegal. <laughs> and, uh, Debbie Harlow, who is here, uh, she and I, and Elise Adar, who is no longer alive, unfortunately started a nonprofit and worked from 1984, gathering together the, uh, a lot of the underground therapists, the above ground scientists and researchers, and we prepared to uh, challenge the, the DEA. And we knew that even though it had began really as an underground therapeutic drug, even though it was still legal, it was just kept quiet because it was in a climate of prohibition. And then starting in 1980, we have Nancy Reagan who would just say no and the rise of the parents movement. So MDMA was a therapy drug, a secret therapy drug. It sort of leaked out, was being used as ecstasy in public, and that was inevitably going to cause this crackdown. So Debbie and Elise and I, with a large community, began preparing for this lawsuit. And we were able to prepare by reaching out to a lot of different people who would not otherwise do an illegal drug, but who would be willing to explore doing a legal drug. So uh, the CBS talks, in 1985, just a few dozen psychiatrists across the country were experimenting with the unregulated drugs. Around a million doses of ecstasy had been used by 85. That's an underestimate <laughs> of significant proportions. Um, and they said, that's the way it was on Wednesday, April 17, 1985. So now you're going to see this clip from uh, Dan Mather. Call it MDMA for short. Users have a word for it, ecstasy. Federal officials call it an underground drug that's going nationwide. Soon they hope to call it illegal. Steve Young reports tuning in, turning on, and dropping out, 1985. <laughs> Earl and Marge Deacon are doing something they've never done before, taking a psychedelic drug that may be the LSD of the 80s. It brings me to a state of being absolutely in touch with the inside of Earl Deacon. It gets the ego aside and you are able to see clearly uh, what we're here for. The Drug Enforcement Administration wants it controlled like heroin, a drug considered to have no medical use. We have enough cocaine and heroin and marijuana out there, and LSD, PCP, and they use legitimate drugs. We don't need another drug out there. We don't need this to mushroom and become another problem. About three dozen psychiatrists across the country have been experimenting with the unregulated drug, giving it to their patients as part of therapy. If you're dealing with couples or groups who uh, have emotional bonds, uh, but this is a way of deepening, uh, it creates a state of what I call high empathy. I felt wonderful. I felt, I mean, it's great to be without fear lock. This is one of my pieces now. Uh, I'm more abstract. My work has more impact. Uh, my work is better. I would think that I'm more of a strength of okay? game. <laughs> I had that complete experience of peace and well-being, and I didn't have an addiction to it. Advocates say ecstasy is the drug LSD was supposed to be without the bad trips. <laughs> we heard these same claims with LSD 20 years ago. Uh, we've heard these same claims with cocaine, which is ravishing the United States. Said to produce no hallucinations, MDMA is fast spreading beyond psychiatric offices to the street and campus. By one estimate, a million doses of ecstasy have been used. Steve Young, CBS News, New York. <laughs> okay, so that's the way it was, 1985. And that's, uh, April 17th and July 1 is when the DEA moved to criminalize MDMA. Uh, we were actually winning in the media and we were winning in the courts. And the, the DEA got more and more panicked and they felt like, okay, we've got to short circuit this court system and an emergency schedule MDMA. And it turns out we actually won the DEA administrative law judge lawsuit. But the judge just makes recommendations to the head of the DEA, which ignored the record, rejected the recommendation. Ultimately, we um, 
sued again on the definition of what is currently accepted medical use. We want uh, DEA to figure out how to describe it, to keep it, uh, to reject the recommendation. Uh, we sued again, and they won. This was in the context of medical marijuana, but it was the same principle. And then finally, on the third try, DEA figured out how to keep MDMA illegal that the appeals courts would accept. And then I realized that the only way through and back is through the FDA, through making doing science as a medicine. So in 1986, I started MAPS. And this is uh, the way it is, April 17, 2015. So 30 years later, if you go into Medline right now, and you put in MUMA or ecstasy, there's over 5,000 papers. Now, a few of them are like plays on the word ecstasy and agony and have nothing to do with MDMA. <laughs> but not very many, maybe less than 20 or something. So there's an enormous body of information. And almost all of these papers are funded by governments all over the world trying to justify prohibition. So most of it is looking at the risks of MDMA or ecstasy, looking at mechanisms of action. There's a few papers on the therapeutic use of MDMA, all from MAPS. So far, there's nobody else doing research uh, into the psychotherapeutic use of MDMA other than MAPS. I think that will eventually, hopefully, change. But right now, that's the way it is. Now, this research, we estimate, has been conducted somewhere in the neighborhood of $350, $400 million. It's an enormous body of research in the public domain. And it's mostly about risk. And it's because of this research that we can make MDMA into a medicine through the FDA. Because we could never raise all this much money to make uh, all of this data available. But it's in the public domain. We can summarize it. And then we can use uh, new data that we create in patients to finalize the process through the FDA. So right now, we are in a, a tremendous situation in that we have an open door at regulatory agencies all over the world to do research with MDMA's therapeutic potential. It really is a lot easier to do research with psychedelics than it is with marijuana on a federal level. Um, surprisingly so, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but right now, we are what's called doing phase two research. These are um, phase one we did originally in the 90s with Charlie Grove. And it's uh, dose response safety studies. You just try to characterize the drug in healthy volunteers. Then phase two, you start working with patients. And you try to figure out a bunch of important methodological questions to prepare for phase three. Phase three is what really counts to make a drug into a medicine. And it's larger, it's more expensive. And phase two is the place where you figure out, first off, what is your treatment method? You know, what are your doses? How many sessions? What is your approach during the time people are on the MDMA? Or in the case of Hefter, when people are under uh, psilocybin? Um, what is your patient population? Well, who are you really trying to treat? Who are you not trying to treat? Who do you exclude? Who does this work most for? Who does it work least for? And are there cultural differences in different countries? How do you handle that? How do you uh, train your therapists? And then also, how do you deal with the fundamental methodological question about how do you do a double-blind study with a drug that, if you've taken it, you know you've taken it. <laughs> and if you haven't got it, you, you pretty well can tell. So that is a fundamental problem. Um, we've worked uh, quite a bit to try to solve that. And recently, I've, uh, I've spent so much time trying to be the uh, anti-pharmaceutical company that I missed a really important trick of the pharmaceutical industry, which is to hire retired FDA officials <laughs> as good consultants. So, you know, it's like you, you rebel too much sometimes. <laughs> so we've hired some terrific uh, retired senior FDA officials, and what they've acknowledged is that um, the double blind study really fails in practice for a lot of psychiatric medications, and that there are side effect profiles that people can tell whether they're on it, the doctors can tell. It's, it's not, it doesn't work as much as it did seems like. So we've been instructed to actually in the phase three that it's okay with the FDA for us to compare our therapeutic dose of MDMA with inactive placebo. And the key points are going to be to make sure that we have screened in everybody so everybody's similarly motivated, do the randomization, and then have independent raters who aren't the therapists 
uh, and trained in a certain way to do the outcome measures. So we, we think we've basically solved pretty much the issues that we need to solve with phase two. The other part you're trying to figure out is what is your effect? What's the magnitude of your effect? What's the variance of your effect? And that will help you size phase three. So right now, we are going to be finishing phase two studies for MDMA for PTSD uh, in the fall. And we will have treated We've had thousands of uh, supporters. Probably those costs have been somewhere in the neighborhood of about $4 million. And we've completed studies in Switzerland and in the United States. Our first study was 20 people with uh, mostly women survivors of childhood sexual abuse. This study in Switzerland was 12 people of PTSD from any cause. Then we started trying to think about uh, do men react differently than women? What about combat related PTSD? So we've got two studies in the United States. Um, just uh, yesterday was the first uh, MDMA experimental session for the last subject in that study, 24 uh, people. And for trying to mainstream these psychedelics, we kind of wanted to say that these are for uh, everybody. They're not just for aging baby boomer hippies who you know, remember their youth. It's for everybody. And so this study was designed for veterans. And then we thought, OK, we're going to say it's for firefighters and police officers, too. Because they have a lot of trauma in their work. And we actually have got uh, firefighters and one police officer who've been in this study. <laughs> and most of them are veterans. So we're going to be finishing that study. We've got a study with 23 people in Boulder, Colorado, that's PTSD for any cause. They just enrolled, I think, the 20th person. And we have a study in Canada. Uh, we're treating now the fourth of six people in Vancouver, the first research in Canada in 45 years. And we have a study in Israel that's um, where practically everybody has PTSD. <laughs> um, so once we complete this, do the data analysis, um, we're going to be moving forward as our top priority, MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. If you were to try to uh, develop a drug, a designer drug that would work for uh, PTSD, uh, chances are you would come up with MDMA. And what Sasha Shilgan, who helped really develop MDMA and tested hundreds of drugs similar to it, designed, created, said in the uh, documentary Dirty Pictures that for what MDMA does, it's the best of all the ones. Which is really fortunate for us because we can never afford, as I said, to pay for all the studies that would need to be done if there was a new drug that were better. Uh, but We've got the best drug for what it does. Now, we're also trying to become both experts in MDMA and experts in PTSD. And we also want to think like uh, the pharmaceutical companies. And what they're moving toward now is called pipeline in a pill, where you try to find a drug that maybe has multiple different things that it's good for. And so MDMA enhances psychotherapy. It reduces activity in the amygdala, which is where fear is processed. It enhances activity in the frontal cortex, uh, where you put things in context. It stimulates serotonin and dopamine. It helps you feel great. And it stimulates oxytocin and prolactin, the hormones of bonding and nurturing. It does pretty much everything that you would want a drug for people who are terrified of some sort of trauma and can never get past it. So it also has other tremendous uses for, um, as, as Jim was talking about, Alicia Danforth and Charlie Grote are doing a study now, a math sponsored study for MDMA for autistic adults with social anxiety. And um, since this is Silicon Valley, it's kind of a bit good to say that this is crowdsourced drug development. <laughs> so what it means is that millions of people are doing these drugs, and they're discovering all sorts of stuff about what these drugs are for, like cluster headaches. So it just so happens a bunch of people who were high-functioning autistics went out to parties, took ecstasy. And at the end of it, it's like, wow, I can read body language. I understand my emotions. Something <laughs> changed here. And then they would write some story on the internet. And Alicia started recognizing that there was tens and twenties and thirties and forties of these stories. And so she contacted all these people and whoever was willing to talk to her that she could reach did a PhD dissertation on what these people had to say, what their families, doctors had to say. And that was the basis for our application to FDA to do a study with autistic adults with social anxiety. 
And we've just treated uh, the seventh out of the 12 subjects in that study. And we're getting really good results. It's confirming what people have said anecdotally. And we're also uh, starting a new project in uh, San Anselmo, which is going to be for MDMA for people with life-threatening illness who are scared of dying. And MDMA, again, is really good for helping people confront things that they're scared of. And this study is um, a breakthrough in a multiple different ways, including in a regulatory way, in the sense that this study is able to be conducted uh, not in a cold clinical hospital setting, but we got permission from FDA, DEA, the IRB to do this um, in a home office setting that is it's healing just to get there. <laughs> it's just fantastic. You go through redwoods and you're surrounded by woods. It's, a beautiful, it's like you could imagine a hospital center being built right there. So we are now going to be sort of majoring in MDMA for PTSD and minoring in MDMA for end-of-life anxiety and social anxiety and in um, autistic adults. And we also have permission, and this is something that I think is really important to understand about how committed the FDA really is to um, science over politics. We said to the FDA that um, there's only a certain number of people that have underground credentials and above ground credentials that know what they're doing when it comes to psychedelic psychotherapy. And if we want to mainstream this, we need to train new therapists. But it's illegal drugs, so we need a protocol to do this in. And we said to the FDA, can you give us a protocol to train therapists? And they said, no, <laughs> we can't do that. But we can help you. You have to look like science. You have to do something that looks like a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study. We don't care what you learn. But if it looks like science and does have some measures that are gathering something useful, we'll let you limit who's in the study to people in your training program. And so we came up with something that is science, looks like science, and we can now bring people from all over the world and give them legal MDMA as part of their training. So we have really... train the therapists. Um, now, the other things that are happening that are in protocol development, what I just told you is all stuff that's actually happening right now. But in protocol development, we have a um, situation where starting in the late 80s, uh, we tried to work with the Veterans Administration. Uh, a lot of people had PTSD from Vietnam. And over a course of about um, 25 years, uh, almost 25 years really, we were rejected. We had the people that are closest to the patients, doctors, therapists, are sympathetic, they see a lot of people aren't getting better, they want to do something, whatever they can do. And so we've had people at multiple different VA centers were uh, wanting to do research with MDMA. But when it gets up to the political level, it was always squashed. Now that's recently turned around. And we, we, out of the desperation, there's more than 22 veterans every day that commit suicide. Um, not all of them from PTSD, but some from PTSD. It's a terrible national scandal. The veterans are not getting the treatment they need. The pharmaceuticals and the non-drug psychotherapies work for some people, but they don't work for a lot of people. So in this uh, era of both national scandal about not treating the veterans correctly and also changing cultural attitudes, a lot from medical marijuana and marijuana legalization, the resistance at the military has lessened. And so now we are, we've had to prime the pump though. So actually MAPS is uh, donating $800,000 uh, to uh, military therapists. So we're actually giving the military a grant uh, to do MDMA research. And hopefully that will turn around and they'll give us a grant afterwards. Uh, to do more research. But we're doing four different studies with uh, military, leading military therapists. And the one that's most interesting to me is it's called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. When what that means, conjoint means couple. So it's cognitive behavior couples therapy where one of the couple has PTSD. But because PTSD affects the relationship, that they use this uh, treatment approach that brings in the couple. And actually, when we started talking with the VA's National Center for PTSD about MDMA therapy, they just thought, aha, you know, hug drug, love drug. Ah, let's start with our couples therapy approach. And so we're working with the researchers from Ryerson University in Toronto 
they came down to Charleston to have uh, MDMA experiences to prepare for this. They had such a fantastic time <laughs> that they decided <laughs> that not only would they do this study, but that they would move to Charleston to <laughs> with our uh, Michael and Andy so our lead therapist. So um, we're going to be doing couples therapy. And, and couples therapy is one of the best uses of MDMA, but difficult relationship is not a disease. So the FDA, we can never make MDMA into a medicine for it. But we're doing work with uh, this couples therapy. There's also cognitive processing therapy for long exposure. We're working with the leading researchers of the VA in all of these modalities. And these are also being developed. And we're also now doing what's called our uh, minimal support, minimal therapy study. This is going to be at Cardiff University in, uh, in England. And so it's going to take veterans with PTSD and give them MDMA in a sort of supportive but non-therapeutic setting, stick them in a scanner, an fMRI scanner, and try to see what MDMA does when they read a trauma script or they read a neutral script. And they will also have that same experience in the scanners without MDMA first. And so this is both a mechanism of action study, but it's also acknowledging that in some ways, MDMA is the most inherently therapeutic of all the psychedelics. And what we want to see is how do people do when we reduce the cost of the therapeutic intervention as much as possible by having minimal support. I don't think it's going to work anywhere near as well as our main method, but I think that it will be somewhat helpful, possibly, hopefully not harmful. Uh, and we, we have mechanisms that people are opened up and um, not fully resolved. They can ask for extra support. But this is going to be a study with um, at a military base in England where they have hundreds of people with PTSD. So we're thinking of doing a phase three study after this in England. And so our basic plan is to research MDMA in the US and also in Europe and get it simultaneously approved by FDA and the European Medicines Agency and cross submit the European data to the US and the US data to Europe and then have um, 600 million people have legal access to MDMA. Uh, a map of how MAPS is taking over the world here. <laughs> sites, research sites all over. Um, so this is how it actually worked. Um, so with the military, um, this was Senator J. Rockefeller, and he wrote to Shinseki, uh, and also to the Assistant Secretary of Defense. He said, I'm writing to encourage you to explore innovative treatments for PTSD, including but not limited to MDMA. So um, this was because of the man on the right, uh, Richard Rockefeller. And so I really want to acknowledge uh, the major contributions that Richard made, the tragedy of his death in an airplane accident, uh, last summer, and he was the chairman of the Board of Advisors of Doctors Without Borders. Uh, David Rockefeller is his father, uh, the oldest living Rockefeller, and I think what I really respected about Richard, one of the many things, is that when you're born and you have everything and you don't have to do anything, um, it's hard sometimes. A lot, it's not very good for a lot of people. And he felt like he needed something that was his own, that wasn't just given to him, and he decided he'd become a doctor. And he did. He was a family doctor for a long time and then gravitated into uh, working with Doctors Without Borders and saw whole populations traumatized in Serbia and Kosovo. And he thought, how can we possibly help? I mean, just think of how many people are, um, have lives destroyed and are refugees from what's going on in Syria or all over the place. So we started thinking, what can we do? We don't have the resources. We don't have the therapists. We don't have enough people, but maybe MDMA could help. And so he said, what do you need most help with? I said, it's with the military. So Richard and his cousin Jay helped us. And this was uh, the crucial meeting that we had um, in the Pentagon. And for me, it was a draft resistor <laughs> to go into the Pentagon. And I remember uh, the Yippies had this uh, you know, circle around the Pentagon. And it was to levitate the Pentagon as the uh, <laughs> strategy against the Vietnam War. <laughs> And uh, so now our, our new strategy against future wars is dose the Pentagon. <laughs> here we are, on our way. I think I should have, but I'm not a pacifist. I um, learned from Hitler and Holocaust.
lost that, and I think there are times that you need to defend yourself. So I'm not a conscientious objector, I'm not a complete pacifist. I do appreciate the military. I think it's essential. You look around what's going on. I think that it's hard to, but I think nonviolent resistance is the best way. But sometimes you need to really protect yourself. But in any case, we are now, um, another part of our strategy is that the military has more guns than the police. <laughs> So that's so that they're a counterpart and helping us with uh, struggles with the DEA. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things you learn at the Kennedy School. <laughs> um, so other things that we're doing, uh, we are, as I said, trying to become experts in MDMA and also in PTSD. So we now have a study that's about to start marijuana for PTSD in 76 U.S. veterans. Um, as I said, MAPS was. Um, just had its 29th birthday, uh, April 8th. And we never have got a government grant. We've only gotten um, donations from individuals and family foundations. No government grants, no grants from major foundations. And what um, has recently happened is we got a $2.15 million grant from the state of Colorado. <laughs> And this is so much exactly what we're trying to do mainstreaming because the uh, woman who we're doing this study with, Sue Sisley, uh, was tremendous. We worked for many, many years on this project. Right when we're about to start, uh, I mean, so many obstacles. But right before we were about to start, she got fired by the University of Arizona trying to block this study. And then people came. It was the best thing that could have happened to us. <laughs> Didn't seem so at the time. but. We were approached by the leading researchers for the VA and also for NIDA into marijuana use by people with PTSD. Mostly looking at it as, is it a drug of abuse? What are they doing? But they said they wanted to join forces with us. And so we worked on protocol design issues. We, we now have uh, an alliance with the leading mainstream researchers into marijuana PTSD. And one of the things that we did that I'm really proud of, that um, there's a woman in Colorado, Paula Riggs, who, uh, was the woman who stopped marijuana from being approved for the use of PTSD in Colorado. And she said that um, there wasn't enough research. She's not very sympathetic with marijuana in a lot of ways. And also, um, she was on the committee that was going to be giving out the funds. Uh, Colorado was going to give away around $8 million. So I was trying to think, like, how do we engage her? How do we work this? And I'm, I haven't had a chance to tell her. She, she might realize if she listens to the tape of this dog or something. But I had the most uh, important idea while I was stoned. <laughs> <laughs> I, decided that I was going to the and think, how do I deal with this woman? And, uh, and I thought, you know, a lot of times people accuse me of uh, being biased. You know, I obviously have done these drugs. I think they were. You know, trying to make them into a medicine, so how can anybody believe anything that we do? Because we're obviously uh, not neutral scientists, we have our strong beliefs that these things work, and we're all drug users, not all of us, but <laughs> some people, and <laughs> we're, um, but we're accused of bias. So my response is always, look at the methodology, that's what science is for, that's the beauty of science, is it's to help you overcome your bias. So if you have any criticisms, don't criticize me, but criticize the protocol design. So I thought, with Paula, I can say, we would like to hire you to criticize our protocol design. <laughs> and not only that, but to be in on the inside and criticize every single step that we take and look for bias in all of our methodologies and everything. And she agreed to do that. <laughs> where I kind of realized that the more expensive we made the study, the more likely they were to fund it. <laughs> so I'm super efficient. If you talk to anybody on our clinical team, we try to squeeze the dollar, we try to really you know, get people to volunteer as much as possible. But here, I just felt if we just layer on the consultants and layer on all this, it gets more and more expensive, but then they're like going to have more confidence in it. So it, it was just a weird experience to, to not care about the budget and just sort of say, okay, we're going to make it really expensive. <laughs> um, and, and it turned out right. We got the, we were the um, people that, we were the only ones that had FDA and IRB approval and we got the largest grant. So this is going to be the first and most definitive study ever on marijuana for PTSD. Um, the most important thing I think to say about it is that really marijuana is more about a palliative treatment. It's more like something you would get from a pharmaceutical company. 
because it doesn't cure the problem and you need to use it every day. Most people that use marijuana for PTSD use it every day. And at the end of the meeting that we had with FDA to decide on whether to, uh, FDA would approve this study, and we were already working with them on MDMA, so I said, and, and it was clear that they were going to approve it. I said, I just want to clarify that really our top priority is MDMA because we only give it to people a few times. If it works, they don't need it anymore, and they've really done some deep healing. It's a, about the search for a cure, whereas marijuana is more about palliative treatment. And uh, Dr. Tom Walker, who was the head of the Division of Psychiatry <coughs> Products, he surprised me. He said, Rick, you do not need to apologize for treating symptoms. He said, in the field of psychiatry, that's about all we ever did. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, the basic idea is that patients and others should have, patients and doctors have choices. And marijuana can be a very valid choice for work with PTSD. It helps people with nightmares. It focuses them on the air now. And it's got a lot of value. Uh, also, we're doing... We're working on observational studies. We're starting a study with um, ayahuasca for PTSD. But it's, uh, it's going to take one of the criticisms, in a way you could say, of people going down to South America or elsewhere for ayahuasca is that they don't have a lot of preparation, they don't have a lot of integration. So our older team, when we're doing the MDMA work for PTSD, is going to be working with a veteran who's now at the Naropa Institute. So there's going to be about 15 or 20 vets from Denver and Boulder who are going to go down to the route to the Temple of the Way of Light and get uh, group ayahuasca sessions. And then they're going to come, it probably is also going to be filmed for a documentary. Then they're also going to come back and get follow-up integrative care afterwards. And then we're just going to be observing how well that's working. And it's possibly a step towards trying to make ayahuasca also into a prescription medicine. And you know, there's lots of uh, religious use of ayahuasca. The Supreme Court said that we have the vegetal. The Ninth Circuit said the Santo Daga can legally use ayahuasca in religious services. But I really believe that uh, some people believe it's a sacrament. And I think it's how you approach it. I think it's the relationship you have with the drug. And I think you can uh, respect drugs that are used in a therapeutic context, even if they had an origin in a religious context. And we can still be working with spiritual experiences as well. So I think you can take ayahuasca out of the jungle, into the lab, westernize it, and still help push it. Outcome studies with I Ibogaine for the treatment of opiate addiction. So that means illegal in the U.S., but even in other places in the world. Uh, so um, I just wanted to remind you that uh, Sunday at 9 o'clock on CNN, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, is having an hour-long special on marijuana. He's had two before, weeds and weed two. And they've had, and this is weed three. And they've had incredible impact. I mean, how many of you have heard about the young kids and you know, children that have epilepsy and how CBD can help them? That's from something with this uh, shows. So this one is going to talk about our marijuana PTSD study. It's going to talk about that's with PTSD. It can talk about other things as well, but it's uh, going to focus a lot on uh, on our work. Uh, I've been interviewed. Sue Sicily's been interviewed. Uh, I think it's going to be very powerful and can again open the uh, public mind towards the, the potential value of marijuana and marijuana research. Well, it's, it's it airs twice. It airs twice. It airs 6 p.m. here, and uh, but also at 9 p.m. And then after it, there's an hour-long special, on, it's called High Profits, about uh, cannabis and capitalism. And so we're encouraging people to have parties and um, you know, spend a bunch of hours vegging on the couch, you know, smoking pot, watching. It's not hard as optional. You could also eat it. Sustainable nonprofit 
is, I think, a, an attainable objective. And I think it's part of the story that we're trying to tell the donors that hopefully it's like you're priming the pump, but then we will have products, and the psychedelics will be prescription medicines. Now, here's one of the reasons why um, it worked for um, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, but it's not going to work for MDMA in that same way. The first is that cystic fibrosis is an orphan disease. What that means is that drugs that are 200,000 or less per year are considered orphan drugs. And if you get orphan drug designation, then uh, you have patent protection. You end up being able to uh, sell these drugs for enormous high prices. And their insurance companies will pay for it. It's kind of scandalous. But the sales price of this Clydeco is uh, obscene, 311,000 per year. They had 371 million sales in 2014, up to 460 million. So MDMA is not an orphan. PTSD is not an orphan disease. MDMA is off patent, but qualifies for data exclusivity. So what that means is that Ronald Reagan, in 1984, um, passed a law, signed a law that was pretty good. And what it said was, for drugs that are off patent in the public domain, if you're the first to make it into a medicine, the FDA can't give you a patent, the used patents. We've hired patent attorneys to develop an anti-patent strategy so nobody could ever patent the use of MDMA. So that's out of the question, too, because we just put it in the public domain. You have to originate an idea for you to get a patent. But what it means is the FDA can say nobody can use your data. You have the exclusive use of your data for five years. Nobody else can make it into a generic. And so that's the period where MAPS, if we're the first to make it into a medicine, we have a monopoly on the sale of MDMA. And it actually takes another year for a company to develop a generic. And then if you do studies in pediatric populations, and there's a lot of kids under 18 that are um, traumatized in all different ways, you get an extra six months. So we can actually have six and a half months, uh, six and a half years of sales. Uh, so selling this, though, it's uh, something that costs, uh, it, it's a prop, it's not part of our nonprofit mission. Our nonprofit mission is to make MDMA into a medicine. Once it's a medicine, selling it as a medicine, it's a business. And, and we need to pay taxes on it. But we want to try to develop a new model for the sale of drugs. And so we formed a wholly owned benefit corporation where the goal of that is not to maximize profits, it's to maximize social benefits. And so, Benefit Corporation is going to be funded by donations to MAPS, the investment in the Benefit Corporation. We're not seeking investments in the corporation because that would uh, dilute the ability to be sustainable and it would create opportunities for private gain, or there are foundations that would sometimes make uh, socially relevant investments, but we're looking for donations to, to maximize the opportunity to become sustainable. And then all the profits are used for MAPS mission. Um, this is hard to see, but I just want to show you. This is the money trail for the $2.1 million from uh, the state of Colorado. Just to show that it comes from the state of Colorado in the maps, and then goes down into the public benefit corporation and into Johns Hopkins, and it's got all different partners that we have. Uh, so, and we're going to be working towards training psychedelic therapists, establishing our own network of clinics to set the model for the standard of care. We're going to um, create all sorts of medical context for safe and beneficial use of psychedelics, and then we'll fund future research. Now, I've talked to you mostly just about uh, medicine and therapeutic uses. And I just want to say that part of the strategy is this chart. So if you just look here, um, this is the uh, bottom is the public support for legalizing marijuana. The top is the converse. It's people who are against legalizing marijuana. And so what you see here, <coughs> Okay. So right here is 78. This is starting to rise in the parents' room and crack down. This here is the uh, election of Reagan. So this is 25% or so. And it stays that way for almost 20 years. And then it starts to creep up. And then just a few years ago, it crosses this line. More than 50% are in favor of that. For a while. So the question is, what happens right here? Well, 1996, that's California and Arizona passing uh, medical marijuana initiative. So when you medicalize a drug, it changes people's attitudes towards the risks of that drug, and it changes their attitudes towards whether it should be legal or not. So I think the medicalization of psychedelics will help contribute to the legalization of psychedelics. 
And I think we need to acknowledge, and we know from the way that to ask you people raise their hands, that mm -hmm. most people, there's a lot of uses for psychedelics for treating illness, which is very important. But I think the normal illness of being alive, of trying to figure out what to do, <laughs> helping people will benefit enormously if they want to work psychedelics. And that, that's really the highest and best use is having a culture where people are grounded, are spiritualized, and don't have as much repressed material. And so I think the medicalization will help lead to this. And it also, this is from the Christopher Family Foundation. Uh, this was an article in the Maps Bulletin about how does clinical psychedelic research support human rights? Basically, the right to explore your consciousness, religious freedom, uh, cognitive liberty. And this is the final slide. <laughs> uh, this is a, a book, New Genesis, Shaking Global Spirituality, by Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And he was uh, someone who, uh, I was in contact with in the early 80s, uh, back when Debbie and I were uh, working with the nonprofit before MAPS, and he wrote this book saying that the United Nations is for conflicts between nations, but a lot of these conflicts are religious. So we need sort of a global spirituality to get the mystics to be a counterforce to the fundamentalists. And the more people that are mystics and have direct spiritual experiences that aren't so hung up on my religion is the right only way, and people then become. Uh, aware of how much we have in common with everybody, how we're more alike than separate. The same is true of the environment. Out of this comes the environmental movement. Uh, so I think the long-term goal is psychedelics uh, integrated into our society, helping both people with medical conditions and also the larger group of people that are just normally uh, trying to struggle with what it means to be alive and then die. And that if we can have a spiritual <laughs> renaissance, that then we can have uh, both a uh, much better world and also a sustainable nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs>